Amen. Now, one of the reasons that the early church was so successful is that they listened to Jesus. Oh, they, they tried a few things on their own. Jesus tells them in Acts chapter 1, don't go anywhere, don't do anything, my translation, until the Spirit of God comes on you. They stayed in the upper room and they prayed. And um, then they had a little business meeting, which to me was not of God, church business meeting. They made an election, which to me was not of God, because you never hear about the person elected to be the 12th apostle, because God already had it planned that Saul, being made Paul, would be the 12th apostle. He basically told believers, they were born again believers, but he said, you still are lacking something before you step out in ministry. And that something is the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues, and it remains so to this day. There are some people who think that this is a lying wonder or a lying sign or something like that, but those are just religious people. That's exactly what the Pharisees would have said. In fact, the people that came running a little later in this verse, or in this chapter, says, oh, they're drunk, because they didn't understand it. When you're first baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues, your mind doesn't understand. Your mind says you're making it up. It's gibberish. Because your mind is used to controlling speech. But praying or speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, your spirit does the speaking. It bypasses your mind. And so your mind is unaware of what's going on and thinks it's crazy. But it's by the Holy Spirit, in your spirit. Now, Pastor Mary Beth and I have been places where uh, the Philippines, for example, and we were in a very small village at one time when we, we had a very difficult time getting there. They had a terrible typhoon just before we arrived. Eighty percent of the island was flattened. There was no electricity. There was no transportation. This village was cut off, and we had to cross fallen banana tree trunks to get into the village. And when we got in, we, didn't, we were very, very late, and we had another place to go after that. So we preached the word to them, and then we prayed for them. And we said, we don't have time for you to tell our interpreter what we need to pray for and the interpreter to tell us and then us to pray and the interpreter interpret the prayer. So we're just going to pray in the Holy Spirit. And we laid, started laying our hands on them and praying in the Holy Spirit and they began to rejoice and shout and we knew something was going on, we didn't know what. And the interpreter, wide-eyed, looked at us and said, when did you learn, or I don't know, when did you learn, why didn't you tell me you knew warai warai? And we said, we don't even know what that is. That's the language, that dialect is what that village spoke, Warai Warai. And we were praying in that dialect for exactly what they were coming up for without them even saying what they needed as the Spirit of God was praying through us. Didn't ha now, we've been in many, many countries. We prayed in many, many places. It didn't happen like that everywhere. It happened there like that. Why did it happen? One of those things we'll have to find out from the Lord when we meet him in the air because at that point it happened. It happened in Washington, D.C., as Pastor Mary Beth was, and we were having a service like today. As a matter of fact, the Lord spoke to me a few minutes ago. Normally, we have communion right after worship. We're going to gather everybody around the front for communion uh, after the word today. We're going to ask you to just step up. Ushers, we want you just to hold the communion elements, and everybody's going to step up. And we're going to gather around the altar for communion. We were like that years ago in a hotel ballroom, and we were praying in the Holy Spirit. And uh, the next day, a, a university professor from Spain who had been in that service called me and asked me when Pastor Mary Beth had learned Italian. And we said, well, she doesn't know Italian. At that time, we didn't. We learned later. He said, no, don't tell me. I know that my friends got me right in front of her, and she knew I was there, and they told her, and she spoke right to me in perfect Italian. He, he was from Spain, but he spoke Spanish, Italian, and French, and English. And... Uh, I said, well, I can assure you she doesn't know. I said, but by the way, what did she say to you? He said, she said this, open your heart. This is the life I have for you. I want to come in. And I said, well, that was the Lord Jesus speaking to you to, be, to open your heart and receive him and be born again, which he was on the phone, born again, prayed with me. 
and then went back to Spain and started a Bible study, which I, last time I heard of him was about 10 years ago, and this was about probably 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, he was still, the study was still going on campuses in Spain. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here, <clears throat> there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because everyone heard them speak in their own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, aren't these all from Galilee? And we are, every, every one of us hearing in our own language, wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them all speak in our languages, the wonderful works of God. They were all, let me just make a mention there. You can be sure that when you're praying in the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be praying death and destruction. You're going to be praying the wonderful works of God. Those that have already happened, those that are currently happening, and those that will be happening. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what does this mean? Others mocked. Oh, they're, they're just drunk. Peter, standing up with the eleven, Filled, uh, lifted up his voice. Now, this is where I want to look. We're going to start really here. Peter, now there's 120, but Peter and the other apostles stood up. They stood up, and Peter shouted. Peter raised his voice. Now, let's just contrast this, because today's message is called Everything Changed. The last time we see, see Peter, what do we see? He's afraid. He's pitiful. He bumbles with his language. He denies Jesus three times, goes out and weeps bitterly. Then we see him running to the tomb, but we don't see him preaching. We don't see him as a man of God. We see him as a follower. We see him as very human, very frail and fragile. And now he stands up and he shouts a message out. He lifts his voice and says, You men of Judea, and all that dwell in Jerusalem be known unto you and hearken to my words. He suddenly has a boldness and an authority that he didn't have before. He's telling them, listen to me. He's shouting to them, listen to me. All you who are detracting, all you who think this is not of God, all you who are in wonder and amazement, listen to me. These are not drunken, as you think. It's the third hour of the day. But that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, he immediately ties it to the scripture. So now we see him boldly declaring, telling them to listen to him and tying what he's about to say to the word of God, recognizing the present move of God being prophesied prior to this time by a prophet of God, found in the word of God. In other words, living the word of God, the word of God that was spoken and recorded now being lived among us. And he says, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heaven above and signs. And he goes on with the rest of that scripture. But I wanted to point out the fact that he is now boldly declaring the word of God. He has changed. What made the change? The power of the Holy Spirit. When you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, did you change? Was there a change that took place? Did you allow the change to take place? Everyone who's baptized in the Holy Spirit is changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can look at Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter, well, let me go to the end of Acts chapter 2 for a moment. Because uh, he says, verse 41, Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day were added 3,000 people. Peter, his first message. Peter, the first time he speaks with this boldness on behalf of the Lord. The first time speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 come into the kingdom of God. Can anybody tell me when Jesus would be teaching daily up on the temple, was there a day that 3,000 came flooding into the kingdom of God? Now, of course, he didn't give his life yet, so nobody could be born again yet. We know that there were many, many who followed him, but we don't see a singular event 
where 3,000 declare their allegiance to Jesus. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, the church will do exploits. And Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. And he add that to the fact that he said, it's better that I go to my Father in another scripture because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit. So he is telling us that he is sending his Spirit for us to continue his work, for us to expand his work, not just to sit, and hear about his work, but to stand as Peter and the eleven stood and do his work. The Holy Spirit is upon us, not to bless us, but to bless through us. Not to just speak to us, but to speak through us. Not to just empower us, but empower us to do the work of the ministry. All of us, not just pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers, and evangelists. All of us, every believer, empowered by the Spirit of God to do the works of God. Here in Acts chapter 3, we see an example. Peter and John go up together to the temple, the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily. He's there every day. He's there every day, which means to me that Jesus would have passed him. He would have been there when Jesus would go in into the temple. But the moment had come for the church to assume the work of the ministry. And so this day... He sees Peter and John. He calls out to them, asking for money, asking for a handout. Peter fastens his eyes on him with John and says, look at us. He gave heed, expecting to receive something. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He leaped, stood walked, entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, praising God, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew it was he who sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him through Peter and John. Jesus now ministering through his people. Jesus now healing through his people. Jesus using the agency of the Holy Spirit in the church to continue the work that he came to do. He is alive. He is not dead. He is alive. If he's alive, what's he doing? The same things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, except he's doing them through believers. That's why we're called believers, because we believe for the greater works. We believe for the work of the ministry. We believe in Jesus' name. We believe to lay hands on the sick and they recover. Later on, Peter is questioned about this. And now, not only is he changed with boldness and changed that he's not afraid to lift his voice and not ashamed to bring healing to somebody, but he also is changed with an understanding of the name of Jesus. Verse 16, his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, is there any difference between Jesus' name 2,000 years ago and his name today. His name, through faith in his name, could that be the difference? Faith in his name. Has the church in general lost faith in his name? I would say yes, because I see many churches and many people who are not expecting a miraculous move of God. What has happened to the church that we have... We, and when I say we, I don't just mean, I don't mean this church, I mean the church in general, that the church has become so impotent that all they know to do is to come together and sit and listen or sing and not do and not be challenged to do, not be challenged to change the lives of the people around us. That's why we exist. If the Lord just wanted us to come into the kingdom of God, we would have been raptured the day we were born again. Taken out. But no, he left us in to make a difference and to change the people around us. And he's given us the tools and the power and the name in order to get the job done. But we've been lulled by religion to sit and think that by coming to church and sitting, we've done some great work for God. When we do a work for God, we do something. He even told us, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. 
In my name you'll cast out devils. He wants us to be doers of the word, not just hearers. He wants us to actively pursue the things of God. And he gives us Jesus not only as our Savior, our Shepherd, our friend, Captain of our salvation, Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth, paid the price, rose with the keys of hell and of death, but also our inspiration, that we would walk like he walked, do what he did, expect God to confirm his word with signs following. But we need to act upon that word, speak that word, do that word. Let's go to Acts chapter 4, verse 1. As they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They just didn't like the fact that they're preaching Jesus, that they're speaking in Jesus' name, that they're praying in Jesus' name, that they're healing in Jesus' name. They laid hands on them, put them in, in prison until the next day, for it was now evening. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. From Acts chapter 2, there were 3,000, to Acts chapter 4, there's 5,000. Now, are we seeing numbers like that? No. Most places are not seeing numbers like that. Some that are, are seeing numbers like that because they're entertainment centers. I have nothing against entertainment. I would love to have all of the bells and whistles, and you know my personal uh, affinity for indoor fireworks. I would love to have all of that. I mean, we could. I, I just, I, I don't know about, the ceiling's not high enough. I might burn the place down, so I'm not sure if I want to do that just yet. But you can have all of that, and you can have tens of thousands of people, but if you don't have one thing, the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be doing the work of the ministry. It's time for the people of God to rise up with the Spirit of God and do the works of God. Here, it says, and it came to pass, verse 5, the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, now and Caiaphas, funny, we know those names, don't we? Annas, Caiaphas, aren't these the people that had Jesus arrested illegally and tried illegally in the middle of the night? Handed over to the Romans for capital punishment, for crucifixion, for so-called blasphemy, which never took place? Same two. Different outcome now. And Alexander and as many of the, uh, of the kindred of the high priest, yeah, kindred, it was a family thing, they were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they asked them in the midst, they put them in the center and said, by what power or by what name have you done this? You can just sense their sense, their, their feelings of inability. They can't understand it. They're just enraged that these two Galilean fishermen could have a mighty miracle that they don't even attempt. They, it never crossed their mind to ever even try something like this. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? The Word of God explains why. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he's made whole, be it known unto you and all the people of Israel, by the name of Jesus Christ. We still have that name. His name is still the same. His name has not changed, whether you say Jesus or Yeshua or Yeshua or whatever language you say that name. There's still power in the name. Power to heal, power to deliver, power to transform, power to save, power to forgive. And there's still the power of the Holy Spirit to all those who welcome him into their lives. That's what we celebrate on this day. Now, I remember 
I was raised Catholic, most of you know that. And um, in May, past, I remember the day, it was May 20th, my seven years old, first Holy Communion, anybody who's been Catholic, you know that. And then you had a second thing that, you, that, that would take place, and that would be your confirmation. And your confirmation, the bishop would come and pray over you. Now, at the time, I think you were 10 at that time, had, didn't have a clue what that was all about. And then after I'm born again, and I'm preaching, and I, I come across something about confirmation, and supposedly that's when you're filled with the Holy Spirit at your confirmation. That's what that's supposed to be. They have taken and made it into a program of some sort with no reality. There are many people today who try to explain it as one experience. Well, when you're born again, you're born of the Spirit, so you receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are, but then tell me why. In John chapter 21, when Jesus breathes on them and says, receive you the Holy Spirit, he tells the same ones, don't go anywhere, don't do anything till you be endued with the power from on high. And they're the ones that are in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Tell me why, when Philip goes down to Samaria and preaches, and there's great joy, and, and, and there's a revival in Samaria, and they send for Peter and John to come down and lay hands on them that they be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do we see over and over and over in the Word of God, which is our source book, our guide, two separate experiences, and yet today, so many will say, oh, it's all, if you got one, you got them both. I don't see it. Either we believe the Word of God, or we don't. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are empowered, the power of God, to do exploits, to do the work of God, to do the will of God. Now look at this, verse 13. Now, when these others, the Pharisees and the leaders, saw the boldness of Peter and John, where did that boldness come from? The Holy Spirit. That boldness came from the Holy Spirit. They were not bold before. Does it sound bold to deny Jesus three times? Does it sound bold to run when Jesus is arrested and, in fact, they've got a hold of you and you just let your clothing be torn off and you run away and they, they have your clothing? Does that sound bold? That was Peter and that was John. And now, they see the boldness of Peter and John. They're not afraid any longer. They're not afraid what the Pharisees would do to them. They're not afraid to declare the word of God. They're not embarrassed. When they see the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They are not ashamed that they didn't go to Bible school. They're not ashamed of not being proficient as the priests and the scribes. They know Jesus, and that's all they need to know. They know the power of resurrection. They marveled. They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. My question, the people around us in the world today, do they recognize that we've been with Jesus? Or can they not tell the difference between someone who's been with Jesus and someone else? It was evident that these two had been with Jesus. Is it evident to the people around us, we have been with Jesus? It should be. We should not be hiding out. We should not be trying to be like everybody else. Now, I am not saying we have to be weird and unusual. That's not what we're saying. What I am saying is that we are empowered. The world is weak. The people of God are strong. The world have, has no weapons against the enemy. The people of God have weapons of warfare, armor of light. The world does not have the advantage of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The people of God have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every miracle throughout the Word of God, Old and New Testament, can be categorized under one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And today, the Spirit of God is the same. He hasn't changed God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus has not changed. It's the people. It's the church that's changed. A week ago, I gave a message, what is church? If you remember that message, what is church? And I'm not talking about the building, I'm not talking about the label, I'm not talking about the denomination or the name. I'm talking about the people. We are the church. 
People have changed. People no longer believe and trust and act and step out. Let me ask the question. You're in a big storm out at sea. Jesus comes walking on the water. Would you be one of the ones to get out of the boat? Would you get out of the boat? Would you even think to say, Jesus, if that's you, let me come walk on the water? Out of the 12, only one did. Would you be that one? Would you be the Peter and John to reach down and pull that guy up? It's one thing to have a healing line like we do, and we pray for the sick, and we move on and pray for the next one. They reached down and pulled him to his feet. Would you have that boldness? I guarantee you can. I guarantee that. The more we pray in the Holy Spirit, the more boldness we, are, we have, the more power we have. It's like a dynamo. We, we're churning that power, producing that power. So let me ask that question again. Have you changed since you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you changed? I told you at the very top of the service, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I changed. I changed. I, I was not who I used to be. I was changed by that power. Now, I didn't begin ministry right away. I didn't even know I was called into the ministry. But once I started ministering, I was not going to minister wishy-washy, compromised word. One time, Pastor Mary Beth and I, at the very beginnings of our ministry, after the children's church, children's church is where we started, we were, uh, we were asked to take a healing service. Remember that, Lorraine? I think Lorraine's on with us today. And um, we had a healing service every Saturday morning at 1030 in the morning. Saw mighty miracles. Cancers healed, blind eyes open. New pastors came and took over the church. Didn't come to any of the services. Called us into the office. Wanted to know what we believed about three things. Healing, faith, prosperity. We failed all three. We believed the Bible. Failed all three. He was a good denominational man. And drove that church into the ground. You see, because today, what we need is the Spirit who gives life. Not the letter of the law that kills, but the Spirit who gives life. We are to walk by the Spirit. If we're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, how can we walk by the Spirit? We are to know things to come by the Spirit. We are to live in the Spirit. All of these are scriptural references I'm giving you. This is what God's Word says. We're not just to bumble around in the natural. Compromise the Word of God. Be wishy-washy on faith. Be wishy-washy on the world. We are to be standing strong and firm. We can only do that when we have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside. Look at John the Baptist. I don't advocate anybody being like John the Baptist. He was a wild man. But you know, if you think about it, he was born to a very elderly couple. And I, I, I've thought about this. How did he end up in the wilderness? Well, his parents probably died when he was at a young age. And the call of God comes on him, and he's a wild man in the wilderness. He's eating locusts. Anybody ever eat a locust? Has anybody ever had a locust? You can eat them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you go to Israel, and some tour guide will tell you the locust is the carob seed from a carob tree. If you have a tour guide like that, get a new tour guide, okay? The Bible actually says locusts are kosher. They come under the kosher, kosher laws. Well, if you really think about it, what do locusts eat? They eat grain. So just think of them as little cows. You get little steaks from them. They're just like little cows because they eat grain. But uh, he's eating locusts and he ate wild honey. And that, that's honey. You know, and that's the, the, the tour guide will say, you know, the honey is the key because they make honey out of carob, I guess. I don't know, whatever. But my Bible says locusts and wild honey. I believe he ate locusts and wild honey. You know, that's interesting. We've had the Atkins, we have the keto, we have the paleo. I haven't heard of any locust and wild honey diets. I, I bet that you would learn, lose a ton of weight if you go on that diet. Locust and wild honey. Probably got to go to China for that. Have you ever seen the stuff they eat in China? Locusts on sticks, you know, like a whole, a whole uh, shish kebab of locusts. I've seen that. I mean, not in person. I've seen pictures of it and all kinds of other things. I think... Ken, bats too, right? Don't they eat bats over there? In Wuhan especially. So. 
Anyway, back to the word before I go off here. The Holy Spirit gets us focused. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit directs us. The Holy Spirit opens things to us, opens the word of God. Peter immediately, immediately, by the Spirit of God, knew the Bible reference, knew the reference to Joel, knew what was happening. Are we aware of God's moving in what's happening in our lives? The Holy Spirit shows us. He opens doors to us. You know, I'll just finish with, with one thing. Ushers, you're going to start to get the communion elements ready. You know, we've been helping Ukraine, and um, I don't talk about it every week. We've we're, we're, we got this situation right now where we have 40 tons of medical equipment in Canada, and we're not permitted to bring it across the border into America to ship it to Ukraine. We have to somehow get it from Toronto to Ukraine, so we're working on that. But here's the interesting thing. I got a call a couple of days ago from Ukraine. A man named Vlad. He is near Kiev. And he has a warehouse and a, a, a factory there. And he's, he's heard about us and about what we're moving into Ukraine. And he called. Somebody gave him our number. And he called. And um, he asked. He said, they're, they're, they're producing body armor with Kevlar and nylon. And he said it would be so appreciative if we could get our hands on any of the raw materials to send to them, to their factory, because they're producing it right there, making it all right there. Now, I showed you a picture two weeks ago of seven pastors. Seven pastors. Uh, four of them have had their churches destroyed. All of them have been shot at. And all of them in that picture were wearing body armor. That was the request we got from pastors for body armor and body bags, because that's what's going on in the East. So keep Ukraine in prayer and just remember that what God is doing is far beyond what we ever imagined. And we're, we're involved and, and, and apparently Ukrainians know we're involved and are touching base with us. So let's just keep that in our, in our, in our prayers. We want also to pray for various people today. Uh, Joey and Tanya and family are a little bit still under the weather. Keep them in prayer. Laverne. It marked 10 years ago this past week that her son, DJ, went to be with the Lord. Let's keep her in prayer. And, uh, and others, I'm sure the prayer requests will come in.